Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 304th New Social Environment. I'm Nick Bennett, the Special Projects Editor here at The Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between Dustin Yellen and Paul D. Miller. We're also thrilled to have the poet Travis Chi Wing Lao here, who will read to close today's program. We start all of our events with two important acknowledgements. The first is that here in Brooklyn, we are on the unceded land and waters of Lenape Hoking which still belongs to the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. The second acknowledgement is that Black Lives Matter. We recognize the legacy of settler colonialism as a part of the many contemporary expressions of white supremacy. We honor those that have lost their lives to this violence, and I encourage you all to check the chat for a living document of resources and actions as we do our part in the learning and unlearning required to undo this legacy of injustice. And now to introduce today's guest and host. Uh, our guest today, an artist who lives in Brooklyn, Dustin Yellen is the founder and director of Pioneer Works, a multidisciplinary cultural center that builds community through the arts and sciences to create an open and inspired world. In tandem to his institution building social practice, Yellen's artwork makes the hidden forces of nature and commerce legible, drawing on both modernism and the sacral tradition of hinterglass painting. Yellen primarily works through a unique form of three-dimensional photo montage in which paint and images clipped from various print media are embedded within laminated glass sheets to form grand pictographic allegories. Uh, um, we'll post a longer bio for for each guest, uh, for today's guest and host in the chat, uh, to uh, introduce Paul Miller, composer, multimedia artist, and writer, Paul D. Miller, AKA DJ Spooky, immerses audiences in a blend of genres, global culture, and environmental and social issues. Miller has collaborated with many, sorry, with an array of recording artists, including Metallica, Chuck D, Steve Reich, and Yoko Ono. His 2018 album, DJ Spooky Presents Phantom Dance Hall, debuted number three on Billboard Reggae, and he is an editor at large here at the Brooklyn Rail. So without further ado, Paul, uh, take it away. All right, well, first and foremost, hey everybody. Um, hope everyone's safe and been vaccinated. Um, given our, you know, sort of the insane politics of our, this is like 2021 and we're in an era of right-wing delusional issues and whether it be Marjorie Taylor Greene and, you know, and January 6th insurrection, or, you know, just lunatic anti-science stuff that's going on and um, the era of misinformation and post-QAnon. It's a refreshing thing to engage with Dustin, who uh, I consider a friend and an ally of all things doing really cool, smart, dynamic things. So, Dustin, thank you so much for joining us. Um, let's, shall we just dive in? Are you guys ready to roll? Yes. All right. So, so, Dustin, let's start with biography. Uh, you have a pretty interesting dynamic between Colorado and New York. Um, do you want to just give us a little bit of background, like where you, you know, just give the audience like how you got to be in this spot from Colorado, because that's it's a big jump. Well, I mean, how far back I, I, I was born in Los Angeles. I think my mother decided to leave my father on mushrooms when I was five. Then she decided not to uh, expose me to the metropolitan world of a city and took me to the mountains in Colorado. And she, she, where I, she raised me in Colorado, or some would say I raised myself because she was working a lot and sort of I would, I would wander, I would wander and I would ro roam aimlessly, if you will. Uh, then, um, let's see, to make it a short biography, I dropped out of high school. I, I wasn't really uh, connecting to that system, I guess, because I wanted to leave real bad. Um, Let's see, uh, I, uh, I, then I traveled, I hitchhiked, I left Colorado and I hitchhiked through New Zealand and Australia and into Thailand. And it was very formative for me uh, because I was you know, not exposed to much, I think as a young person sort of get out there and sort of wander, uh, helped me see, uh, more facets of the world. I got back to Colorado and, um, you know, I was making art and making shit and making things. And I, th this woman I know introduced me to, a, to this weird physicist who uh, 
turned me on to all these weird things. You know, I didn't, I didn't really have a traditional schooling. So he was the first person to be like, have you looked at Buckminster Fuller or Nikola Tesla, or have you read any, you know, Rilke, or have you looked at it, you know, just kind of like some lighthouses, if you will, uh, to, to circle my boats around, which was super inspire, inspiring and helped me, you know, and I was doing a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, psychedelics uh, at the age of 18. And I was, I was exposed to a lot of these things. And, uh, and this physicist, you know, I asked him to, I asked to study with him. He was pretty out there, but I ended up spending <laughs> some time with him. You know, he was like, I'm dying of cancer. The government gave it to me because I'm trying to make free energy. I mean, he was way the fuck out. Wow. And I was like, cool. And, and, you know, he's like, anyway, he's like, you don't want anything to do with me, but I like begged him. And, uh, and next thing you know, he was like putting me in a closet uh, with like a quartz crystal on my chest, listening to whales and injecting me with drugs. He's like, you're going to think you died. <laughs> you're going to think I killed you and you're dead. Don't you worry, this will pass. And, um, and then I would leave my body for an hour at a time and sort of navigate the multiverse. I, I found out later that this was ketamine. Um, uh, and... Uh, it sort of was very illuminating, if you will, at, at 18 years old. Um, and I think after that, those experiences of navigate, navigation and making things and sort of being in nature, but thinking I needed to go more into an established civilization outside of nature, I moved to, to New York City. Wow, I mean, that's... that's yeah. No, that's a really powerful um, series of connected dots there. What's beautiful about the work and your, your kind of the narrative arc of where you're coming from is that there wasn't necessarily like you said, you dropped out of high school, you floated for a while. Most Americans, as you said, don't travel unless than I think a certain percentage of the American populace, a small one that has a passport and even travels very much, let alone is exposed to other cultures. And that's what I see resonant in your work. I mean, there's this kind of like you've captured these tableau, these very specific narratives that are almost at the edge of science fiction, in fact, over the edge of science fiction. And the Latin term is called vivarium, which means uh, in the situation of life. Um, uh, and so I'd love to see just from that perspective, what you just described. Um, I, I know we want to focus on your work. You know, that's the top priority right now. But I also want to see how that connects to your practice. Like, you're into everything from quantum physics to meditation. Um, you've been very supportive of, of a dialogue between science and the arts over the years. So um, let's let's dive in. I mean, what what first and foremost, what's behind us there? What what's going on? Do you want to show us like a little like earlier you were showing us the studio? Oh, I mean, um, I can, yeah. Let's see. This is this is just a work in you know, a sculpture. Kind of think of it as a frozen cinema. It's called the politics. Can you even see what it is? The politics of eternity. Ah, uh, it's the, uh, you know, you have the future on the left, then you have the past on the right, and in the future, we're building a futuristic city, a rocket, a hyperloop, and a particle accelerator, and the future is inhabited by these weird one-eyed astronauts that are sort of building the future inside the mountain, and the future is mirrored by the past, and the past is inhabited by animal-headed humans that are extracting the minerals and carrying them through the mountain to build a totemic antenna to the gods, which is the same scale and position as the rocket in the future. And underneath the ocean in the past is group Sisyphus, where together they're pushing a boulder to capture a sea monster who's eating the boats. And that <laughs> same moment is mirrored in the same sea in the future, but it, uh, underneath that sea, you have the same group Sisyphus, but it's the astronauts and they're pushing a machine to capture data that's coming out of the sea. And uh, everything in the future, like the tree growing here in the future is growing in the same place in the past. Or this field of mushrooms in the past is mirrored by a field of lights in the future. Or the satellites by the moon, by the dinosaurs, by the sun. So everything is mirrored back and forth. And then the past and the future are represented by fluid dynamics falling into the present. We have Mars, the god of war, and, and this weird undersea story and there's a super tanker sinking is an allegory to the ark with animals popping out of it but that's also in relationship to a weird monument that i'm working on and uh and then if you you know come in and study it you'll find oceanic and roman and egyptian and on and on sort of art historical 
uh, references hidden inside the cliffs. Um, wow. Uh, okay, yeah, there's a lot to go. unpack there. Hold on. <laughs> Holy shit. All right, so um, that was like a really wild freestyle. Like uh, you could be doing some sort of uh, new neo painting uh, rap, you know, Tesseract rap, there you go. But, you know, when I think about like what you were just saying, sorry, these uh, AirPods Pros tend to pop out these days, I don't know. Um, you know, there's that whole idea that, that here we are in the physics of underlying our time, we're, we're, you know, we're in space time, uh, three dimensions and, you know, space time. And of course, how we look at up, down, left, right, past, future. Those are issues that define, you know, our experiences. What you're doing is capturing those moments and then adding a mythology to it. Uh, again, at the edge of a science fictional kind of update, like whether it be people like Neil Stevenson or William Gibson or, or Philip K. Dick. So I'd love to hear, um, you know, what, what's the materials? Cause like, how do you work at that miniature scale? Uh, there's issues around, of course, the Latin term vivarium, which are, you know, the more updated term terrarium. Um, I keep thinking of like the, the Truman Show, you know, where, where you have this kind of strange insight that's frozen in a moment because you called it frozen cinema. So let's unpack like the, some of the materials. It's glass mostly, right? And then, you know, you kind of unpack that and make it into small slivers. Is that, yeah, is that a good way? There are like seven large microscope slides uh, together and sort of you know, in this geometry, think, think of each panel as a sort of microscope slide stacked with more slides. So they're just slides of glass and on each slide is painting and, and then cut up books and magazines. I have something called the cutting room. I have this, I don't know why I have this feeling that in, in some decades, we're gonna have a completely different relationship to paper. Mm -hmm. And uh, I love paper. Uh, and I like to read books, you know, now people are starting to read screens and screens are, you know, there's this whole thing happening. That being said, there's, you know, almost like they're like uh, the, the DNA of uh, the species through media and through images that are found in about 70 or 80 years uh, worth of, you know, books and magazines. So, I'm, and then I'm, and then I'm classified, you know, I'm, I'm organizing it all. So I have drawers of animals and drawers of humans at different scales and drawers of machines and drawers of mushrooms and drawers of Roman artifacts versus Egyptian versus, you know, and so I have all these drawer systems, you right. know, that I can use to, to go through um, and, and I'm constantly cutting things up. So it's, just, and then it's just painting. So the seas are painted and the trees are painted. Uh, but then there's this like there, the building blocks of the land are often a mix of paint and found images. But OK, so there's a, there's a kind of a Hieronymus Bosch update there as well. I mean, if you look at some of those classic Bosch recovering from the Black Plague and the way that his panels um, you know, kind of display these kind of surreal tableau. Um, does that does that resonate with you? I mean, Bosch, that kind of the Dutch. Well, I've cried in front of that picture in the Prado many times. Yeah. I mean, when you go when you go to see it, it's you know I feel that's a great uh, beacon for many of my sisters and brothers in arms. So yeah, the Garden of Earthly Delight certainly is a is a picture that I you know uh, love and look up to. Do you feel? I mean, right. Now, as we move, like you were saying, some people are reading on paper, some people are reading on screen. Amusingly enough and strangely enough, what you're doing is dimensionalizing that kind of sense of painting and then freezing it in these kinds of, almost like, again, the Tesseract term is like when you have a multi-dimensional, uh, four you know, interpretation of a cube, and then you have, multi it's, there's a very famous book Edwin Abbott wrote called The Roman, um, uh, Flatlands, uh, Romance uh, of Many uh, Dimensions. I, have, uh, I, read, I was a young man, I read it and I loved it. I've actually found it in a backpack recently where I meant to reread it. I have it on a, a desk pretty far not from here. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean, because there's also this social dimension of your work, too. I mean, I, I want to make sure that we balance both between the visual and philosophical. But how do you feel that your work, because there are certain artists who've done social dynamics in their work, like Nam June Pike uh, with his uh, pieces like Global Groove, which was considered the first satellite performance in 1972 versus these kinds of tableau from Hieronymus Bosch in the late sort of Renaissance. Um, do, you, do you ever feel like the brushwork and other issues come out of that tradition or is it more like a digital version? Or that's what I'm trying to figure. Is well, like, I think- Do you work with computers much? So I actually don't 
or at least I try not to make the distinctions. I don't like for this work, no, no, no computers and generally, but I'm also, you know, finishing an AR, an augmented reality artwork that'll, it'll be at the Tribeca Film Festival next month, been working on it for a couple of years, just trying to finish it. And so, and then I'm working on an animation and I'm writing an animated thing. And so I, and then when you talk about like object making versus uh, social sculpture versus digital versus, you know, social practice versus a digital practice. Uh, I, I tend not to, to have any distinctions between these things. You know, I, I, I have lots of problems I have to solve uh, from an engineering point of view, let's say, to make a sculpture like this, you know, versus other problems that have to be solved to, to animate those seas in that versus other problems that need to be solved if you get if this is descriptive and you then you turn over to prescriptive which is you know how do you you know so you have to paint the water but or versus you have to clean the water right <laughs> or you have to save the water or desalinate the water or share the water and so i don't i don't make many distinctions in sort of the descriptive prescriptive or the or the medium making uh that makes any sense. No, no, totally. I mean, the fun part about it, because most people look at painting as a very specific practice coming out of zero point perspective, mostly in the Renaissance, where they began to dimensionalize. And if you look at early, the Romans, for example, and the Greeks, people tend to forget this, they didn't have the concept of zero, which made their painting and their sense of representation very flat. And when um, the Middle Ages, uh, later on, zero didn't even arrive in Europe until the ninth centuries. So that radically changed mathematics, changed perspective. So you're kind of navigating between that sense of flatness and the kind of like, you, I love the fact that you call it um, frozen cinema, because if you look at people like Werner Herzog, or for that matter, um, who's the guy who did the film Holy Mountain? Uh, which, um, Jodorowsky. Yeah, Jodorowsky. You're kind of triangulating between the Herzog kind of science fictional mixed with Jodorowsky's kind of raw intensity. I mean, Holy Mountain to me, it could be one of your works. Like it's kind of... <laughs> That's a good picture. Do you, yeah, do you, did you like Holy Mountain out of curiosity? Um, I, I, yeah, I liked it. I like. I mean, I'm more of a Herzog guy for many okay. reasons, um, or at least maybe not for many reasons. But I'm. I mean, I I, I love Jodorowsky, <laughs> but and and Werner is also, you know, someone who's had a. I think his works had a lot of influence on me when I was younger. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it's you know, I I don't, you know, a lot of. Yeah, I, I don't go, I don't make distinctions between a poet and an architect, you know, really, or, or, or a writer and a filmmaker, or a, you know what I mean? A, yep. a musician. And a, okay. And a, okay, so let's talk architecture, because I know you, you're working on a project with the Archangels, or is that it's still, it's evolving, right? You guys are going to, I remember you were showing me some no, one piece. Been like, is a senior advisor and dear friend and may help execute it when it comes to pass with me. It's, it's in its, you know, it's in its like COVID put it in a holding pattern in its particular place. It was, it was going very much forward uh, before COVID and, and there's a movie getting made about it called Delusions of Grandeur. And it's, it's a very simple yet complicated project. It's just a monument to the end of fossil fuels. It's an assisted ready-made, a very heavy lift. We're, we're taking a super tanker and just gently lifting it and coding it for a couple of million people to go up to the bridge and learn about the end of oil and the future of energy. So let's unpack that because this just for the audience. It's not every day that somebody's just going to say, hey, we're just going to take a super tanker. What, what Dustin is probably, again, I saw the work in progress. So they're taking a super tanker, which is normally horizontal uh -huh. navigating the ocean, flipping it, uh, you know, basically, you know, 45 to 90 degrees and then making it vertical. Um, and then putting it in the middle of an island in the middle of the New York archipelago. Okay, right? no, the location's not, is that how this works? Do I do that? <laughs> uh, I, can the audience see that? I, if everyone just sort of nod, it's like you're seeing a huge super tanker plop, plop down in the middle, face like kind of down. It reminds me of the Beastie Boys album, License to Ill, where there's an airplane crashing inside of a mountain. But- um, Go up to the bridge. Yeah, but um, it's vertical. <laughs> Well, that's the whole thing. I want it yep. to be like this. The, the, the financiers want it to be like that mm -hmm. because every degree after like five degrees becomes super complicated. Right. 
So it started at you know twelve hundred feet, and then the financiers got me down to like six hundred feet, which is still <laughs> pretty, pretty, you know. And we figured out Arab did the engineering. We figured out how to lift it. You know, there's different pieces of it. You know, getting the boats not the hard part, but getting the boat to a location and lifting it, and then making it safe for for people to go up it is is, right. is the complicated part. And then the the idea is just it's you know these tankers really enabled the global fossil fuel system to scale quickly by moving the oil around and uh so to, to sort of take it and then make that seat of power a monument to the end of it and then also to be able to you know be a touchstone for people you know you, you know like a trump supporter could bring it who, who doesn't believe in anthropogenic uh climate change could go in there and with the and be like oh this is bullshit and but like their kids are going to be still like, mommy, poppy, can we go to the top of the boat? And then they get to the top of the boat and they're like, oh, holy shit, man. Maybe this shit's real. <laughs> okay. I well, I mean, but what's this is a common core theme in your work. There's a child like a, a childlike fascination with scalability. Like uh, not every day is somebody going to feel like, hey, let's go and grab a huge super tanker and flip it on its side and, and smash it into the ground. And then have that be a kind of a try. It's like a playground in verticality at the end of the fossil fuel era. I mean, so these are these are I think themes that uh, generate a lot of. Again, they're just saying this as a someone who's you know we've known each other for years now. I'm intrigued like to unpack the kind of philosophical implications because say for example, um, there is a uh, what's a French philosopher named Simon Simon, uh, Simon de Laplace in the 18th 19th century, it, the idea of human consciousness as deterministic, like, do we have free will? And he called it the demon that would, uh, which then um, a couple other people were able to take, you know, whether it be, I'm just thinking about how we choose these things. Um, are we already being, our choices being made for us? The daemon, D-A-E-M-O-N, um, you know, and there's a lot of issues around choice and selection in your work. I mean, you're choosing myth, you're choosing science. Um, these are, but in a playful way. Um, how, where does that come from? Like, there's a kind of, like a kid playing with models, like maybe when you were a kid, was there like a, cause I used to build models of like, you know, uh, X-wing Star Wars spiders when I was a kid, you go to a model store and you'd be able to, and play Dungeons and Dragons, for example. There's also kind of a fun Dungeons and Dragons or science fictional vibe too. Um, does any of that come out of childhood or is it more of a recent thing? That's what, I'm just I'm curious. Well, I I, I, I definitely like to combine things, you know? Mm -hmm. So I have a problem with naming things though. Yep. I find, I think a lot about naming, you know, naming languages through time or just even the idea of language, uh, at least this language that we're using to do this now. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I don't know if I can answer your question except <laughs> to say that, you know, when I walk down the road, it all feels much the same. It all feels like these little, you know, the tires off the car or the children in the street or the cars themselves and the buildings and the grass that's growing in between them all rise and fall from the same thing. And, and that this great hallucination of, of reality or simulation or metalation or fucking, you know, constellation, but this thing that we try to grapple with language is um, is a reflection, you know, is a reflection or a reaction to another movement that we cannot name. Okay. So let's put it this way. I mean, I mean there's a semantic kind of um, operation in work here. I mean, if you look at like Rene Descartes and the idea of Cartesian and logic and like Descartes always said there was this daemon that would be animating our thoughts right at the edge of what we could describe and of course Plato's myth of the cave for example where you're projecting these you know kind of shadows on the wall and saying that's that's real I mean that's kind of like what I see when I look at your work it's like you're taking us to these hypothetical spaces you're freezing them in time again that the term frozen cinema which is a great it's like you're you're a director of this hypothetical theater piece of some sort um that's again, there's a very famous Philip K. Dick short story that reminds me of that, where they, this, these um, people open their refrigerator and there's like a civilization in the freezer and the civilization keeps building and doing stuff 
similar with uh, Borges. There's a couple of short stories from Borges that remind me of your work too. Um, so let's let's pivot for a second because we've talked about architecture. We've talked about some of the materials. Let's talk for a moment because I know this was like a little bit of a parenthetical because I, I think Pioneer Works is an incredibly important space. We have some of your former artists and residents there. Uh, Beth Coleman's in the audience. Um, who did Sound Lab, if anybody remembers that one. That's a classic 90s. Hey, Beth. Um, there's various other folks uh, from Japan tuning in. We got a whole bunch of people from different areas of the world. Um, let's talk about, just for a pivot for a second, Pioneer Works, you and Jan 11, uh, you guys are the, the dynamic duo there. You want to just talk a little bit about how that started, what, you know, the, the driving philosophy there is? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, you know, it's, I had a dream, do you know what I mean? It's kind of really, <laughs> as you know, something very much like a delusion of grandeur. I think in something very simple, you know what I mean? It, it, you know, in the mind at least. And now, yes, I mean, it, you know, what it is now and what it was then are two, two different things of, you know, the same ilk. But yeah, it's, it, it, it started just almost in a childlike naivete, I think, of, of, you know, why aren't there places where everybody's coming together to learn from each other, to share, to exchange ideas and to help each other make shit and build shit and dream together. So I think that's where, it, you know, it's Genesis was like, wow, if, you know, if when I was making my work over here, someone over there was making a record and I'd be like listening to it. And someone over there was, you know, doing astrophysics and someone over there was, you know, designing a building and someone over there was, writing code and you know that all these things sort of inform our reality and and we could learn from each other in sculpting that reality and so i think that's probably you know i could go on and on obviously um about its genesis and then and then all all the incredible people gabriel Jana, uh <laughs> our board i mean i wouldn't even know like again i have such a problem with naming because in remembering names uh naming you know i can't explain it naming is tough for me but the, suffice it to say um yeah at this point it is a, a village and a uh, constellation of, of people uh dreaming together to make that reality right but uh, what's so, I, what's so powerful about it is it's a, it's a kind of again to, this is a term beth uh, coleman likes to have the uh, cultural alchemy um, I'm fascinated with how you've been able to pull it together in a very independent manner. I mean, if you look at the shed or other kind of current, the shed had a budget of billions of dollars. Uh, um, Bloomberg was behind it. You guys pulled this off with a lean and mean budget uh, and repurposed this uh, incredible building. Without, well, I just started like, you know, begging, you know, I was begging people. I was like, first I had to beg to try to get the building. And I did almost did I walk around it over and over and over <laughs> and I'd invite people over there and be like, help, help. And they'd be like, let's build a hotel. I was like, no, or like, you know, <laughs> a famous successful artist would be like, oh, Dustin, you don't need this building. I'll buy it from my atelier or like everyone had their own fucking story. And I was just begging at that point. And then once I begged enough and borrowed enough to get the keys, then it was like the next stage of, of you know, I, 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 you know, people would come to the studio. I'd be like, just God, buy this piece of art. and We'll get fucking water heaters. Or like, you know, <laughs> this piece of art, we'll get some stairs. And it was like that. And, and, and I was rather shameless, uh, you know, and desperate, you know, in the sort of like, please help kind of like, if we do this in the first year, the budget, oh, then I had to start a board of directors and learn what a 501c3. I mean, I didn't know, I don't know any of it. I did not know any of this stuff. So I had to kind of learn along the way. Um, and uh, so I just, in the first year it had a $200,000 budget as a nonprofit, which was funded by my artwork. And so it started out with just begging, you know, and dreaming and borrowing and scheming and leaning and all the things that we do to try to make meaning. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a power. Do you want to pull your device? Remember, you were earlier. You showed us. You just did a quick uh, survey. If ever, if you could just show. Us, this is your studio, but your studio is next to the building. Can you? Yeah, just, yeah. yeah. Just show everybody. Like maybe. That's Matt. Matt and Anthony moving a piece right. of glass. They're motherfucking badass artists in their own right. <laughs> I can't not articulate that enough. <laughs> um, 
there's some stuff, you know, oh yeah, so all this is work in progress. You know, mm -hmm. so this is like what, these are all just in progress. Each two tables is one sculpture and these will be here from between five and eight months, I guess. So here's two, two halves of a whole. I don't know if that's working. What are they anything? called? Do, do you have a title for them yet or are they works in progress? I call them psychogeographies. Psychogeography, okay. Sometimes I'll name them. <clears throat> Then I'll give them sort of another layer of text. Uh, they're kind of like playing cards and they're meant to be together, but they've all been separated. This is probably like number 114. Um, I can show you, you know, um, see, and they just go back and forth. And back. I don't know if this actually works. No, it's cool. People, I mean, I think we'll probably generate some pretty intriguing questions about the materiality because um, those are all huge panes of glass, right? I mean, they're serious well, those industrial. Those stacks together would, you know, would make something that is nothing, you know, and then comes around and becomes something. Um, and what's and that? Then, are we seeing a labyrinth? Maybe is, I'm, it's hard to. Or sort of a, it could be a labyrinth if you want. Or it could be a microchip if you want. Okay. Uh, it could be the architecture of sort of rigidity and. Uh, geometry, uh, it also, you know, sort of symbolizes sort of this natural intelligence um, meeting with technology and then uh, the fluid dynamics of the body. Okay, and that's water at the bottom. Okay, so, I mean, this is where that Hieronymus Bosch remix kind of idea. I mean, it's kind of like you've frozen these. Yeah, it's very theatrical. As a matter of fact, speaking of speaking of theater, you you did something at the uh, New York City Ballet too, where they had ballet dancers respond to some of the work. Do you remember that one? Yeah, it was a while ago. Yeah, I don't know if this works, but this one's new. Okay, that's cool. Is, is that yeah, that's a sort of a robotic figure? Okay. This is so cool. I mean, the audience, just for everyone out there, I mean, these are works in progress. We're getting a slice oh, of somebody that, doing their thing. Yeah, and it's just really refreshing wow. to see that. Yeah, you, when you see the broken, like sliced fragments, that's it's amusing if that's the visual equivalent of what you do with audio sampling as well. You pull apart a song or a small clip and you edit it until it's unrecognizable and you build something new. Um, so and these are all incredible. I mean, it's just really... I've seen these in multiple venues throughout the world when I've been traveling. So it's all like kind of cool. That's like cut the shit out of there sometimes. Yeah. So wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's go back to those ones. So those are still frames of the works that eventually are compiled or are they all slightly separate? This? Like, yeah. That's an installation or constellation of, you know, the negatives, meaning often this started out as garbage and I picked it up off the floor and I was like, this is nice garbage. <laughs> and uh, I framed it. But you see, like, those are now living in there, right? Right. Right. Okay. Well, I mean, it's very rare that an artist would be able to convene such a bridge between the, the basically, you're, it's a, a practicing museum, much like Mass Mocha or The Shed. That's, a, yeah. you know, that, I like that. Yeah, no, it's totally cool. Oh, it's what, what's it called? Well, this is, you see, I'm taking the moon out of the stomach. Kind of like, okay. like, you know, the moon, you know, being a piece of the earth, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I, it's hard. It's a little hard to see from this angle here, but I, I now I can see the moon. But can you go to the side just to show the audience? Those are all small slivers. Everybody see that? It's like visible, but then it's like eerily, um, like you've kind of got this fragmentation going, but very precise slivers of things. So a tremendous amount of craftsmanship that goes into that. I mean, let's talk about glass. I mean, because do you... I remember one time we bumped into each other in Venice randomly. I was walking down like one of these piers and you were, there's a whole Venetian glass blowing component. I remember you were, you're into looking at different kind of glass I mean, work. I, I'm into transparency actually. I don't, I do love glass, but I'm not into, I wouldn't say I'm into it more than I'm into rocks. I might even be into rocks more than I'm into glass or maybe glass rocks, but I mean, they're the same <laughs> thing. I just love transparency. So I would say, you know, I'm always trying to find uh, cleaner, transparent materials. You know, when I was younger, I used resin. Um, and then I stopped using the resin really just to 
because of the toxicity of those resins and, and now there's new stuff, new materials. But I'm, at the end of the day, it's transparent. I'm looking, you know, I'm accumulating uh, two dimension, two dimension, two dimensional, two dimensional, two dimensional, right? Right. And so, so for me, it's the transparency. I don't really have a relationship per se to glass. So I love wood, okay. you know, like all these things are the same. Okay. The, the, the beauty of the glass and the way that it slices into these kind of paperwork and then you dimensionalize it, it's really intriguing because if you, if I view your, the work as somehow making that dimensionalization part of the, the, of the underlying fabric. Like if you look at, I'll give you a funny example of people who use fragments like um, uh, Edward Mapleton, uh, who is a, is it Mapleton? I always forget the guy. It's a photographer who broke everything into small slivers back in the late 19th, early 20th century. Uh, Doc Egerton, for example, when they, they, they flicker a camera very briefly and they're able to ca capture all this, it's called motion capture. Um, and so too with films like The Matrix, for example, where they put cameras around all the actors in a circle to be able to capture the, the fight scenes. I remember the first Matrix, there's this one scene, this reminds me of your work, where a helicopter crashes into the side of a skyscraper and the whole building ripples out and the glass is shattering. It was a, when you walk out of the first Matrix film in the late 90s, early 2000s, everybody's jaw was dropped from the just like the way that they did the motion capture, like the bullets flying and then stopping, uh, you know, things like that, where, you know, Keanu Reeves is running and, he, you know, there's a guy, the, the agent, Mr. Smith, where he goes, Mr. Anderson, you know, kind of it, there's that funny moment where that technology, what you're doing is, is dimensionalizing it in a beautiful, elegant way with the, both the paper and the glass, which a cinematography kind of approaches. It's, yeah, motion capture and somehow being able to kind of dimensionalize it with these kind of vivarium. The, the, I keep going back to that Latin term, vivarium, the situation of life. Um, so I know, just want to be respectful of time. Um, it's, it's now 1.40. Uh, Nick and Fong, do you guys, I mean, Dustin, are you open to have a couple of questions from the audience? Well, I'm yes, indeed. Okay. Um, and Nick and Fong, or do you want to just intervene for a moment or is there, or how are we doing for time? Just want to be respectful of everybody. Um, we're good. We're doing well. I mean, we, we do have some questions from the audience. Um, I don't know if Paul, you had anything else you want to cover before we get to Q and A, but, uh, okay. we can... how about like two more quick questions for Justin and then yeah. we'll open it up. Justin, you cool with that? That sounds okay. Great. So, all right. So I, I've asked about architecture, I've asked about philosophy, materials. Let's think about the near future. What are your next projects? Um, I see that you're working on these series um, and you're also looking at AR. Any other kind of technologies that you're, you're kind of checking out? XR, VR, AR? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I'm thinking a lot about the mind. So I'm spending a lot of time with a lot of doctors who are thinking about the mind and the future of mental health and the future of, of uh, new medicines. Uh, Specifically, I suppose what are called psychedelics. So I'm thinking a, a lot about that with a group of people. I'm thinking a lot about Pioneer Works and, and what PW could be in 10 years and trying to sort of, instead of work from such a place of desperation, uh, like the last decade of like, fuck, this is like, you know, this is, you know, like, fuck, we're gonna die unless we make a miracle happen right now to a place of like, oh, wow, you know, the, the support will come if we just do the work and then do the like 10 years out. What does it mean to get the observatory built? What does it mean to get more uh, folks access to what's happening in the buildings? You know, all of that. So like, I guess PW 10 years out, I'm thinking about, I'm writing an animation right now. So I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking about, um, obviously the you know i'm the politics of eternity i'm thinking about that the thing behind me so i'm, I'm thinking about the next making the next one because that'll take two two years so i really mm -hmm. want to get that started uh, i'm all, i'm thinking about how people get along you know i think you know how do we get and that goes back to psychedelics and the mind and perception but i'm thinking a lot about you know i'm always asked people the first question that i ask people usually or the second or third is you know what do you find to be the most pressing issue facing the species you know, like that's the first question I like to ask people. Okay. Uh, and, and so I think about that a lot. Like what is the most crushing issue facing our species and the contentment, the uh, well-being, the, uh, 
the uh, you know you know what 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 is it what is it that we're going to have to contend with as a species you know in the next 10 20 30 40 50 100 years and how our current narratives around our existence uh, have such a great effect on how we relate to each other right so oh by the way there was a couple of things you mentioned that, uh... I just want to make sure the audience is aware. You were talking about the observatory. Do you want to unpack? Because I know you're in the process of getting it together. Um, there's going to be an observatory uh, that's very unique to find your work. So you want to just tell them? Because I, I don't know if everybody is aware of that. I mean, it's just, it, we're building, we are building an observatory, uh, which will, you know, be a tool to expose people to the cosmos. Um, obviously, there's light pollution here, but with software, and even without, you can still see a lot of the crowd pleasers. And it's really a tool to bring in, you know, kids and, and, and people who are not kids to, to, to become closer with these moving bodies. And it'll be free and it'll be on the roof. And it sort of also is a great symbol to the, to the heavens and, and into, you know, into what we will build to come, if you will. Right. Uh, so yeah. So that's in progress. Okay. I mean, that is, these are all epic situations, like to, whether it's taking a, shipping it to a boat and putting it a vertical, or making a crazy observatory on the top of your building. Uh, I love the way you casually just like, oh yeah, I'm just we're doing an observatory, or oh, we're going to flip a ship on the side. Um, so, last but not least, because I, I do want to save time for the audience, we have some people with burning questions. Um, we obviously have seen the, the impact of politics and the whole Trump anti-science demographic, uh, whether it be people like the QAnon and misinformation uh, sort of demographic. Do you feel um, that art has a power of telling truth in this era anymore? Because it's like we're in the middle of this. I think the pandemic wasn't just a biological pandemic. It was a mental pandemic. And um, places like what you're doing with Pioneer Works are a serious antibody. Like you guys are giving us better antibodies to fight this stuff. Um, do you have any thoughts on like art and truth or can art help give people better tools for thinking right now outside of this sort of era of the post-Trump lunacy that we're seeing going on? Just a thought. Well, sure. I mean, what did, I don't know if it is or it isn't. What did, what did Rene Dumonet, I can never fucking say his name, Rene Dumonet, you can help me say art is a lie to reveal the truth. But uh, Oh, that's, I remember that. That's a great one. Yeah. But uh, I would say that, uh, I would say, yeah, I mean, unequivocally, you know, we all, I hope, can agree on Nina Simone. And so if we can all agree on something, then uh, there's so much hope in that. And I think that's, that's the place that um, culture has for healing and for, for progress and for a more just and equitable world. And the fact that Pioneer Works is free, everybody in the audience, it's incredible because that's a huge statement for an artist to do because there's a tremendous amount of um, financial outlay to make these kind of independent spaces happen. And Dustin, by, by having his work um, engage with the mechanisms of having that public space, public funding, um, you know, like totally open, it's a really big and very powerful statement. So Dustin, I want to I want to say thanks for your time. I do want to open up to the audience because I want I think people have some great. And if Fong has any closing remarks, because we have about fifteen minutes, um, and there's some great people in the audience. So um, Nick, do you how do you want to do you want to? And then we have the poet who's going to be closing things out too. So I just want to make sure everybody has time. Sure. Um, how do you want to roll with that? You're you're the moderator. Sure. Um, well, thank you both. Um, thank you, Dustin, for giving us. Uh, a wonderful view of, of works in progress and works in your studio. Um, we have lots of questions from the audience. Um, I'm just gonna jump right into it. And I'm going to pass the mic first to, um, to Rich, who had a question about your process, uh, Dustin. So Rich, you should be able to turn your microphone on now. Oh yeah. Um can you guys hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, thanks a lot. This, is, this has been great. I have a million questions, but as a, as a collage artist who's tried to sandwich things in glass, um, I'm just curious about the practical uh, use of paper and, and what, what you use, if anything, to adhere the paper between the, 
between the sheets. I mean, I'm basically just because it's the real, the real thing happens when I glue the glass together. So I'm just using a glue stick. <laughs> oh, all right. I, I kind of figured. So, but how do you glue the glass then? I use a, a, a glue called Hextall. Okay. Wow. All right. Great. Thanks so much. And I, and I was up in uh, Corning at the glass museum and I, I just kind of wasn't expecting it. And I stumbled upon that amazing piece up there. So thank you for that. Oh, thank you for not not liking it. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you. And by the way, corning is what makes all the glass uh, for our cell phones. By the way, you know, so when you when you have an Apple, it's called Gorilla Glass. Amusing enough, Dustin's the, the concept of like here we have a rectangular surface that millions of people are viewing data and information. But what's fascinating is that Dustin's been taking glass from these incredible industrial situations and flipping it into the arts, which I always find. I, I wonder one day if there ever was a hypothetical conversation between Justin and Steve Jobs, that would have been an intriguing one. Um, but so let's, Nick, do you want to go to the next? And Rich, thanks for your question. Uh, Nick, do you want to sure. jump to the next one? Sure. Uh, um, thank you both. Uh, next question, I'm passing the mic over to our friend GE. GE, you should be able to turn your mic on now. Yeah, hi, thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you, Dustin. Of course, thank you for the rail. My question is, that does Pioneer Works, that surge of multidisciplinary co-working spaces that you have, they're so badass, creating all these opportunities to work along folks with varied uh, expertise, like, does it include, like, writers and poets? Um, and I'm thinking of, you know, like, you know the, the convocation of, uh, of all the people in the French Renaissance and the French Renaissance writers and poets that were as equal scientists as anything else. Oh, um, 100%. And moving forward, yeah. They're in there now. <laughs> Absolutely is the answer. Excellent. Well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Nick? Thank you. And I, thank see, you and I see Fong wearing his sunglasses there. So, uh, <laughs> hey, Fong. <laughs> Thumbs up. <laughs> All right. um, okay, cool. So the next question, um, I'm going to pass now the microphone over to James Steubenrock. Uh, James, you should be able to turn your microphone on now. James, can you hear us? Uh, James, your, 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 your microphone might not be turned on. Sorry about that. Okay, there we go. Oh, there you are. Oh, can you hear me now? Yep, yep. you're there. Okay. Um, so I was struck by, uh, uh, again, thanks to, uh, to all of you for putting this on a great conversation. Um, Dustin mentioned how much uh, he likes paper and books, and I'm certainly uh, of that era of, of books and paper and really enjoy their materiality, the portability, all of that, that you're not, uh, you know, it's a very old technology. You're not dependent on electricity. Uh, you're not dependent on the internet. And, um, and how that is largely being replaced in the culture by screens. And I was just thinking the other day that a lot of new knowledge things that we're learning in the past few years, things about say computers themselves, um, that information never really makes it to paper or to books. And so in that sense, we're, we're really very dependent on this huge, enormously complex global system that has also been shown to be, you know, time and again, um, extremely vulnerable. I mean, look at like this pipeline hack that recently happened. Happened, um, uh, And so going forward in the future indefinitely, it seems to me that we're increasingly dependent on this very vulnerable system to keep operating in an uninterrupted way, not just for you know, daily purposes of communication, but actually for holding the body of human knowledge. And I just wonder, I wonder whether you kind of directly address that idea uh, in, in, 
in your work, Dustin, and, and, and whether you and, and Paul, <laughs> do you guys ever worry about, you know, the big crash and what that would mean for? I worry about it all the time, <laughs> every day. I mean, I can't even, I don't even want to go down all the lines. That was a softball. That was a softball question. I wanted to make a work that was like that. I never got to it yet, but I was going to take, you know, on the, on the big, uh, you know, tankers and, and shipping boats, they have these orbs that they drop in an emergency. They're like lifeboats. They look like almost little orange UFO orbs. Oh, wow. right? And so I had this plan, maybe I'll get to it, which was to take one and cover it in like a solar skin and then put all of our data in there, you know, mm -hmm. both paper and have like terabytes and then a cannon that shoots it out into the sea and they sort of float around. But, but I certainly think, you know, with this work, I'm thinking about that all the time because I'm thinking, you know, there's gonna be a lot of things in here that in a hundred or two or 300 years or maybe after an asteroid or after a meltdown or after a nuclear fallout or after, you know, many possible variables, uh, one were to dig this up the way we've dug up you know, art of Mayan artifacts or dug up, you know, whatever. Uh, right. And, and go, you know, read them. So, so I do think about it all the time. And, and if anything, I'm, I'm like, can we print that? Can we print that? Can we print that? And I'm like, can we put it somewhere <laughs> on a shelf and forget about it? Right. You know, you know how we have the seed bank? We need to have yeah. the paper bank. Svalbard. Yeah. 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 So now, I visited uh, and, and James and paper bank. James and Dustin, amazing. I visited Svalbard and oh, man. Dustin's work, it's like a seed bank of the ideas. I mean, that's, you know, because there's all these different allegorical, I mean, I, I keep thinking of the Hieronymus Bosch update, but it's like, I worry about our species becoming extinct over, I mean, we're in the middle of the sixth grade extinction. Right. Um, and again, like places like, like, the reason I keep saying Pioneer Works is like helping us provide antibodies to the sort of mental pandemic. Um, you know, anti-science, anti-progressive, anti, you know, what's your, name, what's your name, young man? James. Yeah. You just made me come up with a great idea, man. I want to do that. Is anybody doing this yet? I want to, I'm going to start to make a work, which is basically because I'm obsessed with caves already. Did anybody here read Underland? It's I'm, a reading fantastic it. I'm reading book. it now. It's incredible. Oh. It's incredible. Yeah, cool. So, but I have a new piece I want to make. So, and this will be where, isn't the piece made once you just like name it? Once you um, it. So, so it's going to be like a giant fucking cave, uh, kind of like the seed bank. And then there's going to be technology in the cave to print out the shared data that's coming online now. And a lot of people are working on just the sharing part. Right. Uh, in, so that in this cave, it's going to be, it's going to be like a, like the seed bank, it's going to be the paper bank for shared data around medicine, around physics, Medic around quantum computing. And so inside the cave right now, as we have this conversation, all the folks working at MIT and Stanford and, and wherever, what have you, all that new stuff is getting printed in like really great archival ink outside of any UV light. And it's going to be the paper bank. Well, thank you for, for that, James. Sure. I got a million. Um, <laughs> well, dude, by the way, it's it's 156. So I want to make sure we have enough time for Travis, the poet, who's going to, um, and Fong, Nick, yep. you guys want to have any? And Dustin, thanks again, man. I really appreciate you making the time. And it's been really you. refreshing to, um, to yeah, unpack, we're... I think, some of your ideas here. It's very rare. I mean, we got some really good good stuff here. I, we're, we're doing good on time. I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, okay. I am now going to pass the mic over to Jana, who just posted a question in the chat. So you should be able to activate your mic now. Hi. Um, I was just, I, I uh, was thinking a lot about in, in, exiting this like global and uh, biological and mental pandemic and as our funding structures are are shifting and I, i'm just really inspired hearing about the start of pioneer works and how um excitingly experimental and um, prominent this space is at the center of 
the arts and sciences. And I'm just wondering, as we're, as we're evolving from this year, what other voices would you like to be seeing in the conversation in interdisciplinary spaces um, like Pioneer Works? All voices, one voice. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I really feel that way, you know, I really feel, you know, everybody puts art up on a pedestal, but, you know, I really kind of come from a more sort of, and I think it goes probably farther back than boys, but, you know, you know, I, I walk by a brick building and I'm like, look at the way those bricks are laid or look at the way that thing came together. And so I, I think that all voices would be the answer to that question. Thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, okay. I think I'm now going to pass the mic over to uh, my colleague, Catherine. Catherine. In um, thanks so much, Dustin and Paul, for today. Um, Dustin, the piece behind you sort of looks like someone could maybe move through it and like ascend and descend you know the steps that are created by the glass and I'm wondering how you think about scale and movement in the process of um, planning and making your work um, yeah that's my question well I think well I'm just finishing one I couldn't show you now it's in this device with using AR so you can like an accordion you could spread it out and with your fingers, you could make it any size you want and then move through it like you're describing. So I'm kind of working on one like that, which exists digitally. Um, but as far as scale, it's, 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 uh, I think of it as being very malleable. I think I often work very small to try things and test like testing, testing. And then when things work, then I try to push it, push it. I'm working on a bronze right now that, you know, is nine and a half feet, but in my fantasy world, it's 75 feet, you know, and like there's these little animals walking up this weird DNA staircase in one of the legs, and they're all coming from the 1919 eclipse that helped, you know, general, general relativity come to light and be, be tested in it. And there's an ear listening to, and an ammonite reflecting the ear, listening to the eclipse, which is creating ripples and then these weird sort of astro animals are coming out in 2D of the ripple and starting to uh, descend the staircase and they sort of turn into one another and they're all trying to lick a bagel, which is actually a black hole. But as they keep going up the stairs, there's a, there's a bird knot trying to grab the tail of a kangaroo that's going inside of an ornate doorway into a brain, which has this strange monkey climbing a ladder to try to get out of it. <laughs> That's one leg that I'm working on. Uh, but when I think about scale, I think it's um, super malleable, right? I often think that we are one cell rushing through our arms. And at the same time, we are one star rushing through space and simultaneously trying to bridge that gap. Awesome. Um, thanks so much. Excellent. Thank you uh, for that wonderful answer, Dustin. Um, thank you also for sharing your, your psychogeographies with us today. Um, for our final question, I'm going to pass the mic over to the Rail Zone, Fong H. Bui. Fong, you can turn on your mic. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Dustin. Um, so much. We know each other the longest time, and I admire what you've done since the day. And I think that just to answer you, GE, about poetry or poet involved with um, pioneer work. In fact, in December 2015, at John Ashbury's birthday, Dustin Pioneer Work organized a huge event for John, who was our advisory board member since day one. And with Ben Lerner, with, you know, Monica de la Torre, John Yao, and others. It was a main event. So that's just so you know there's a serious involvement with all the seven arts, Esther Rail. That's why we have this deep kindred spirit. And um, yeah, you know, 
the thing about it you, that I thought about you, Dustin, as I try to think of, of my, myself, what I'm doing also, you absolutely write about boys, the social sculpture, about the latitude of the so-called classic foxes against the hedgehogs, the Isaiah Berlin famous essay 1953, who I have the pleasure to meet and talk to him about it, you know? It's, it's really meant to be a game with the academia took it so seriously when it was published in his famous book, Russian Thinker in 1977. That's when a lot of brilliant people began to mobilize into the academy. And very soon, the next two decades, they became specialists and they forgot about all the things that can cross, cross pollinate, which reward them to their own um, thinking and creative energy. You know, we, after all, the word Renaissance meant both rebirth and the ability to cross pollinate, to feed your own creative impulses. We know that. Uh, but I watch you many times. In other words, there's a lot of sign and dust and yelling when he come on and give a talk uh, on whether in some lecture hall or, you know, in TED talk, you sound very tight as a scientist would sound, whereas you sound super relaxed and chill here. My point <laughs> is that, no, no, I mean, I, I know, I know what entails. The, the kind of discipline when you need to do a tight talk, a delivery of a very intelligible, academic or intellectually rigor kind of uh, delivery. I, I, I only think about this because over the weekend I was cleaning my library, just a tiny bit, a little bit, and I discovered Alan Cutrell book of essays called uh, Learning Life and Art. And I reread two articles, which so interesting. The first one he wrote, he was so young, he just barely graduated from graduate school in Columbia, uh, just essentially two years after Pollock died. So Pollock died in 1956. He wrote the essay, Legacy of Pollock, 1958. I can be wrong, but I don't think so. I just read it last night. My point is that in that article, he began to propose the idea that, I don't mean that he deliberately say the death of painted but he began to imply that Pollock for having taken the easel away from the act of painting where the whole bodily movement involved in the canvas itself will definitely create a new birth of all kinds of things. Him being the founder of happening with that, dance and all the form of in performance art really came out from that. So he already signaled it's not just painting that, that Pollock is doing. He saw that, which he quit painting eventually, as you know. What interesting though, is like in 64, he wrote that very controversial and much admired those who understood the implication of it, is called Artists as Men of the World, where he began to advocate for the idea, the return of the Renaissance. Like he really already going complete contrary to what Isaiah Berlin, who meant to be is a game, you know, in 77 that came out. My point is that I know that you do a lot of things. I know I do a lot of things and I want to do a lot of things and I'm trying to impart that ability, that inspiration to younger generation, because I've taught for a long time. Uh, I, I want to advocate for that ability. But the point is, how does one begin? You know, I know what my day begin, but I want to know what your day begin. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> when you have a lot of things going on, I have to keep a notebook that tell myself incrementally, one hour I do this, the next hour I do that, throughout from eight o'clock till midnight, easily, and seven days a week. I don't mean, I never stop. So tell us a real picture of Dustin Yellen. I know we hang out together, we chill, <laughs> Underneath there's a very serious rigor in discipline and get things done. So tell share that will be my question, I guess, Dustin. Long, long winded question. <laughs> I don't know how to answer that because every day is different. <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I think I'm I'm certainly I would say that you're describing, you know, I think you're asking how do you do so many things simultaneously? And I would say that I cannot do it 
on my own. So that would be the first answer to that question. I would say it's done with like all these incredible people, you know, <laughs> that I work with both in the studio at Pioneer Works and elsewhere. So I would say by, you know, the choreography or the constellation of souls moving in relation to each other in a way that's uh, harmonious and with purpose and direction uh, is the only way uh, to do those kinds of things. Okay. Um, and each day is different. You know, I don't do well without pouring water over my head. I like to wake up with lots of water. In fact, I spend a lot of my time inside of bodies of water if I could. And uh, I don't, and every day, you know, I just celebrate that I'm not dead or at least this body is not dead and I'm still perceiving this <laughs> that I am perceiving. So I would say that, you know, I try to get more structure, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I try I, in, in what you're describing and I have a lot of structure in the things that I'm making, mm -hmm. but I'm actually like to be kind of free in my body movement. So, you know, I go, I, I prefer to be in nature. So I'm in conflict because all, a lot of the things I'm building are in civilization and in, in cities. And yep. yet I know that the, my moving body on this moving body wants to be in the middle of nowhere. And that's where it finds its resting place to be peaceful. And, and there's so that I'm in complete uh, and utter conflict really with what I'm building. And so trying to find harmony in those two things is something that I look to work for each day, I think. Well, I mean, you answer it, but I will definitely make a visit to, to your studio soon, Justin, and then we can talk more about more detailed things because I don't want to put you on the spot because you are on the spot. So <laughs> <laughs> we're, all, we're, we're all on the spot. We're all right in between. A rock in a hard spot. <laughs> so, so you guys just intervene, and I want to just make sure the audience is aware. I mean, what's so beautiful about hearing both these two gentlemen speak and the fact that we are here in the post, you know, pandemic moment or hopefully moving forward is that this is a new social space. And that's what the whole series has been about. And it's been really, Dustin's been very heartwarming to hear your process. And I, I have to admit, we've known each other for a while. I'd love to see you can see people's minds sparking when they were hearing how you were describing life experiences, philosophical engagement, uh, your studio process, and Fong, y'all, those sunglasses. I, one day I have to figure out, like, <laughs> is that a Ray Charles look or is it like a different, you know, kind of like this the sky look from the, this late seventies? You know, the, um, it's not there was a. Okay. <laughs> so all right so i want to be respectful of time travis is uh, the poet who's going to close us out today nick how are we doing for time just making sure there we're great um thank you fong and and thank you again dustin and paul for this really engaging conversation today um for those of you that have never gone to pioneer works uh, i advise you to go as soon as you can because it really is an incredible place by the way, Pioneer Works is open to public coming through now, right? Yes. <laughs> so go. Um, so last uh, statement, Nick. Uh, the tradition Fong, of ending uh, with a poetry yeah. reading. So I'm thrilled to welcome our Poet Laureate of the Day, Travis Chewing Lao, to the stage. Uh, I hope I'm not breaking up, sorry. <clears throat> uh, Assistant Professor of English at Kenyon College, Travis Lau's research uh, and teaching focus on 18th and 19th century British literature and culture, health, humanities, and disability studies. Alongside his scholarship, Lau frequently writes for venues of public scholarship, and his poetry has appeared in numerous publications, as well as, as his two chapbooks, The Bone Setter from Damaged Goods Press 2019 and Pairing from Finishing Line Press 2020. So without further ado, Travis, the mic is yours. Thanks so much everyone for um, being here and, and staying after that really brilliant dialogue. Um, as a literary scholar, it's always nice to be able to think about visual culture and to think about art more broadly. Um, so thanks for challenging me and helping me think through um, a few things regarding uh, materiality and, and process. Um, so I, I wanted to thank Malvika for uh, suggesting me 
to be uh, one of the readers for the rail series. Um, Malvika and I worked together uh, for a health humanities journal called Synapsis. Um, and uh, we talk about all things medical humanities um, and contemporary culture. Um, so I encourage uh, you all, if you're interested in thinking about illness, disease, epidemic, um, that is the place to go. Um, but on the side, alongside my scholarship, uh, I'm also a poet. I'm specifically a disabled poet um, that is also queer. Um, so a lot of my work is thinking about the relationship between embodiment and sexuality. Um, and in the poems I'm going to share today, they're all very recent. Um, I'm thinking a lot about um, my history and thinking about uh, my Chinese American uh, identity in relation to these other issues I've always been interested in. Um, so the first uh, poem I'm going to read is forthcoming in, in Hypertext magazine, um, and the poem is entitled Face Reading. Um, this is uh, an homage to my grandmother who unfortunately entered into hospice care. Um, she was really well known for, as the title suggests, reading faces. Um, and uh, this is something uh, in her honor uh, and to think about uh, my family at large. So this is face reading. Two fingers can turn with ease to violence. Some things must not be permitted to grow. So I weed with the white lie of remorse, the limp strands that a woman who traded her worn school books for refuge only to gray in entrapment has said it means I was touched by fire and so will be cold to the touch, brightest before slow death and joining the rest of them, those whose brows and eyes are too ashen now to even be told apart. I pay my respects by hand, quick in the manner they left us, so that what remains is the fear we never manage to sweep away. I've been really uh, shaped by the writing of HIV AIDS poets in the 80s and 90s, um, particularly queer uh, writers like Paul Manette and David Wanarovich, uh, and thinking about what lyrical poetry does uh, in relation to uh, mourning and illness. Um, and uh, this poem is entitled Patient History. Uh, and it's uh, in the spirit of uh, one of my favorite poets, uh, Tom Gunn. You learn to track the tremors of hurt in passing as you urge them to pass in peace, like the sutra reminds on wooden beads that you are kin to these tremors, bound to reverberate again, again, through the scale of a life, now the shape of a town everyone drives through but never dirties their souls, because the clay does not wash off cleanly, once it colors you red, that irritant red, hot with the need for healing, but left throbbing for more than new blood, for another tremor of something more than hurt again, than a body mending before its next sundering. You shake because you are angry with life. I think a lot about the issue of desire um, and what happens when different forms of desire collide. Um, and this poem is my attempt to sort of think through that. Um, and it is entitled Found Wanting. Found Wanting. You did, at least after you learned of my want of a different species, a few aberrant forms away from a coveting that does not abandon me even after my wrist is slapped raw until I start to smart as if boys could ever know penance when raised on misunderstanding, such that they latch onto everything, the breast, the schoolyard, the promise of forgiveness. Yet you forgave me, but I wondered for what? Your same wanting found in my mouth, you did not expect to encounter there, your conclusion that I am my, wa my, my wanting, only my wanting. And the last poem that I have um, is in some ways a response to the previous one. Um, this is one I very recently wrote. Um, and 
it is also about desire, but also thinking about the ways in which desire is a thing that it is interrelational uh, and intercorporeal, something that links bodies that are in contact. So I'm trying to think about proximity, pleasure, and desire. So this last poem is, To What Do I Owe This Pleasure? From the clumsy mingling of bodies, neither of us truly owns. Here are we defrocked to our shabby relations, more borrowed than we like to admit, because debt is shared tissue, proof of barest living in worlds teeming with ceaseless owing, a pair of dirtied hands wrapped about another, this work of shared holding, even as we worship the bleaching of porcelain made for sullying. But what could erupt from this dirty state that has accompanied us long enough to forget cleanness itself was traded for in good faith, in good exchange? We lay remembering filthily, owing, owing, owing. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate this opportunity to read. Thank you so much, Travis. Uh, virtual snapping and, and, and clapping around the room. Um, once again, thank you so much, Dustin, for joining us today. Thank you, Paul. Um, we, uh, sorry, just one moment. Um, uh, sorry, we do this every day at one o'clock. So if you are available, join us tomorrow for a conversation between Chip Lord, Steve Said, and Constance Llewellyn. I'll post some links to that in the chat, but otherwise uh, everyone can now turn on their mics to say hello and goodbye. And I wish you all a lovely day. So thank you, everyone. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks so much, everyone. This is great. Thanks, Dustin. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, so Thanks, Thanks, Travis. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Travis. Thank you, Paul. This is beautiful. Thanks, Travis. Thanks, Dustin. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. 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 Thank so you, you came full circle, so to speak. It was such a treat to hear this today. Still, running, so. run, still running in there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I may have known you the longest of all the people here today. Woo-wee! <laughs> <laughs> Love you, Dustin. Love you. Thanks, Brian. Uh, so you guys, Thank you. Fawn, Thank you. Yeah, if Fawn, Dustin, I call you later, OK? Thank you, you guys. And thanks, you guys. All right, talk soon. Thanks, yes, Paul. Bye. Absolutely. All right.